There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Philly Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome Welcome to to Twisted Twisted Philly. Philly. Hey, Twisters, what up? This is Dina Marie, your host for the Twisted Philly podcast. So I have a little bit of a true confession I feel like I have to make. I have spent entirely too much time fucking around on social media this weekend. Most of that time has been spent talking about podcasts, granted, so it feels like it's somewhat connected to what I should be focusing on. But there was an interesting post that made me think a little bit, and it was somebody asking about whether or not listeners prefer single host series, dual host series, more than one host, what have you. And I think that's what some people don't get about me and Twisted Philly. So obviously I don't have a co-host. But the reason I don't have a co-host is because you guys are my co-host, and I absolutely love talking with you every single time I release an episode, so I don't really feel like I need a co-host. When I record, I usually have a photograph on the wall in front of my microphone, and sometimes it's a picture of more than one person, sometimes it's just one, but there are three friends that I imagine I'm talking to when I record. One friend would be laughing her ass off with me, keeping up with all of the profanity. Actually, she would probably be outdoing me. The second one would cringe, and sometimes she would say, no, I don't want to know, stop, stop, stop. And the third would be curiously hanging on each and every word, asking interesting, intricate questions, stopping me to get more detail. These women are some of my best friends. And yes, folks, you can have more than one best friend because each and every person is unique and brings their own precious soul to the relationship. So how can you possibly apply more worth to one friend than another? These women are Pricey, Katina, and Jen. They are who I look at when I record, and I think of them, and I think of all of you. Your posts on Facebook about the show, your questions, your curses, your tweets, and your retweets. I'm talking with each and every twister. So in a way, this isn't a two-person show. It's a few thousand people show. And I appreciate you sitting next to me, laughing with me, crying with me, and saying fuck with me. I appreciate each and every one of you. Happy Sunday, folks. All right, let's get to it. It's time for some what ups. What up to the Abington Moms who founded On Gracie's Wings, the charity created in honor of Grace Packer to provide support to children in foster care, families who are victims of domestic violence, and scholarships for children in Abington School District. Last Friday night, I went to a beef and beer fundraiser they hosted, and it was fantastic. There had to be over 100 people there. There was so much food and friendship. It was such a great night. You can find out more about the charity on Facebook. They've got a page you can follow that's called On Gracie's Wings, and they've got a PayPal account where you can donate. So please check it out. Even if you can't donate, that is totally okay because the page is about so much more. It's about fellowship and memories, people who don't know each other, some folks knew Gracie, but some who didn't, just looking for ways to offer kindness to the community and to one another, and it's really beautiful. What up to our five-star reviewers, Warhol's Cat, which I like infinitely better than Schrodinger's Cat, A-E-D-F-S-M-S-F, which I'm dying to know what that stands for, Sasha917, Wait Hira, Evan Jackson99999, The Great Gumbino, Mary Y, Ms. Rose1025, and Aaron Space Museum. Aaron also asked me to surrender to the desire to create a podcast about the Salem Witch Trials. Aaron, I think you and your fellow listeners know me well enough because once the idea popped into my head, I simply could not get rid of it. So yes, so yes, I am going to create a series about my obsession with the witchcraft hysteria of 1692. It will be part history, part my own personal experiences traveling in and around that part of the country for almost a decade, and a huge part social issues plaguing women in the early days of our country. I don't yet have a title for it. Twisted Salem seems way too easy. Maybe I'll let you guys pick the title. 
The plan is to launch sometime in June, probably in honor of the date of either the first or last execution in Salem. If I launch on June 10th, that would be in honor of Bridget Bishop. See, I told you I'm a freak. I know when each person was killed. I have a book from the 1800s that I bought in an antique shop in Salem that is the entire court transcript of the court of Oyer and Terminer. Every word, every accusation, every bloody lie. It's compelling. So by hell or high water, I am launching a second show. Fuck me. And I'm in Indianapolis on June 10th for CrimeCon, so I'll have to make sure the first episode is in the can before then so I can launch while I'm on the road. Holy crap. This feels a little bit like finding out you're pregnant and getting your delivery date, although I don't have an exact date just yet. And it has nothing to do with Philly, which is a little scary. But that's what you've got to do. You've got to just put that shit out into the universe, set a date, and then back in everything you must accomplish to meet that date. I project manage the shit out of my life sometimes. Then the universe throws wrenches in along the way to test my strength, and that's okay because I just get stronger. Something that renews my strength is being outside, especially walking trails behind my development that eventually connect to Valley Forge Park. Yes, I'm a city girl, but I love those first few weekends in March or April where you can tell winter is finally on its way out and everything smells fresh and wet. We're a few weeks away from Earth Day 2017, and did you know that the very first Earth Day, well, really it was Earth Week, started right here in Philadelphia. It was founded by a group of students and professors from University of Pennsylvania Design School who first conceptualized the idea of Earth Week. And it was activities dedicated to focusing on our planet and how can we improve and preserve the Earth. Here in Philly, founded by concerned students and teachers who were worried about the future of our planet 40 years ago. One of the standouts from that first Earth Week was a broadcast on CBS. People all over the country could see the massive outpouring of support at teach-ins and events in Fairmount Park and at Independence Hall. The environment became as important as peace and anti-war movements. The organizers called attention to factories and incinerators destroying the air and rivers in Philadelphia. It was probably the first time the phrase filth Adelphia was used outside of private circles. Walter Cronkite even hosted a one-hour special that included reactions from the White House to Philadelphia's Earth Week activities and footage from all over the city. One of the biggest Earth Day observances was in Philadelphia, where an estimated 20 to 40,000 persons gathered in perfect weather in the city's largest park. It was an Earth Day success story, a major demonstration in a major city, but it did not come easily. There were many organizational problems, including a heated controversy over whether to accept financial aid from industries causing pollution. And during that special, there was a local man who stood out. He wasn't an honored speaker, but he was someone who just happened to be in the right spot at the right time. He grabbed a microphone for a few minutes, and those minutes were captured in the CBS special. And the next thing you know, this guy was telling anyone who would listen that he was one of the organizers, if not the founder, of the country's first Earth Week. That guy was a man named Ira Einhorn, who was also known as the Unicorn Killer. Like much of the country, Philadelphia in the 60s was a time of tumultuous change, flower children, anti-war protests, hippies, and free love. Although, when I look back at pictures of my parents during that time, now I was born just one year before the first Earth Week, my mom looks like Annette Funicello from Beach Blanket Bingo, and my dad looks like James Dean with a pack of smokes rolled up in the sleeve of his tee riding a motorcycle. Clearly, my parents were not hippies. Einhorn was a local activist around the University of Pennsylvania campus where he went to school and around the city. He ran in circles with some of the biggest names in social and political activism. Einhorn was friends with the founders of the Yippie movement and not the Yuppie movement. We're not talking about Perrier drinking, Porsche driving young urban professionals in the 80s. 
But this was the Youth International Party founded by Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin. And unlike some of his contemporaries, Ira Einhorn wasn't just big on the activist scene. He was brilliant. The guy was a genius. He was a legend in University of Pennsylvania, which gave him cred to float in and out of any circle in the city, especially those filled with the brilliant minds of Philadelphia academia. And he had a lot of names for himself. He was the self-professed hippie guru of Philadelphia, the hippie guru of peace and love. Personally, I think if you have to brand yourself, you're not doing a good job of organically living and breathing that brand. But Einhorn was definitely someone who stood out in any crowd. To look at this guy, granted, I really dig guys with long hair and facial hair. So pretty much any guy from the 70s is going to get the butterflies swirling for me. But Ira Einhorn looks like something is off. It's just the way the photographs of him have always seemed to me. There's something in his eyes. And it's an expression a friend of mine used about my ex-boyfriend. And damn it, he should have used that expression when I started dating that guy instead of after I broke up with him. But he said he always thought my ex-boyfriend had crazy eyes. And that's what Einhorn looks like to me. He's got this incredibly long hair, huge, full, thick beard and mustache and crazy eyes. Yes, he was brilliant and an incredible, unconventional thinker. But that doesn't necessarily mean all the synapses were firing at the right pace. Einhorn didn't really have any kind of a job, certainly not in the traditional sense. His job was manning the streets of Philadelphia in an effort to fight the man, fight government, fight the establishment, and create a pathway for younger activists coming up behind him. So in that respect, he was someone who was keenly watched by big business, although not in the way you might expect. Corporate America in Philly in the 70s, well, they were interested in Ira. They were interested in his ability to speak to this generation that wanted nothing to do with commercialism or capitalism or any other kind of ism. Einhorn was so smart and such a visionary that no one really minded his strange behaviors, his disheveled appearance or his stench. One point his friends make time and time again in interviews is that Ira Einhorn smelled bad all the time. It wasn't for a lack of personal hygiene, quite the opposite, in fact, because Ira was known to take baths for hours. But, you know, a bath doesn't really get you clean because after about five minutes, you're sitting in a tub of your own dirt water and you eventually need to shower. It was more his clothes because he never washed them. So it doesn't matter how well you wash your junk. If you put dirty clothes on over said junk day after day, your junk is going to stink. I guess he didn't realize he could be a well-laundered LSD-dropping activist because, yeah, he definitely did the LSD. But people tolerated all of this because he was eloquent and charming, he was brilliant and charismatic, and he was so well-known as a local celebrity throughout the city. His friends, however, they also called him an egomaniac. And no one knows you better than your closest friends. So these businesses and corporations in Philly took care of Ira Einhorn. They paid his living expenses. They gave him money for food in exchange for his unique and unconventional consulting services. And he wasn't visiting them in their boardrooms. He set up shop almost like a mafia don at a desirable center table in a Philly restaurant called La Terrasse. That was in University City. And it's where he met a young woman named Helen Maddox, or as everyone who knew her called her Holly. Holly Maddox was born in Tyler, Texas, which is a long, long way from Philadelphia. She was the oldest of five children with a younger brother and three younger sisters, all of whom grew up in a very loving but very conservative family. Holly was a dancer and a cheerleader. She was an all-American girl, a good student, a good daughter, a good sibling, and she was smart. She left Tyler in 1965 to attend the prestigious Bryn Mawr College in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And once she graduated, she didn't go home to Texas. She stayed in Pennsylvania and moved to Philly. And Holly was beautiful. She was tall and willowy with long blonde hair that was worn in that iconic 70s style with the middle part. She actually reminds me of a young Grace Kelly. 
she'd been in Philadelphia a few years where she threw herself into the women's movement before she walked into La Terrasse on October 1972 and met Ira Einhorn. Holly was instantly taken with his presence, his ability to command a room, and the presence that engulfed everyone within view. She was swept away by his ideals and his activism, and he was swept away by her beauty. Within two weeks, they were U-hauling, and she moved in with Einhorn. His politics aligned with hers. His activism was exciting. Being in his presence, regardless of the stench, was an experience, and Holly Maddox was completely taken with him. That relationship that was born in a time of free love and changing the world quickly turned dark. For all Ira's rantings about peace and harmony, he had a dark side to him, something his friends still seemed shocked to realize, because for all of his quirks and strange mannerisms, violence and aggression was something no one ever suspected of him. But it was a side Holly saw on a regular basis, and it was something her family once saw too. Now, I can remember the tension and anxiety the first time you introduce someone to your family, and I'm sure you all can too. Will they like him or her? Will they think your significant other is good enough for you? And ladies, let me tell you, your fathers will never think any man is good enough for you, and that is their job. So don't fight it, just accept it. Holly Maddox waited about a year before bringing Ira Einhorn home to Tyler, Texas. She was a beautiful young wasp, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and Ira was an unusual, overbearing, disheveled, long-haired Jewish hippie who smelled. This was not an expected pairing, to say the least. And to make matters worse, when Holly called her parents about a year after meeting Ira to tell him she wanted to bring him home, she told them, you won't like him. That's a great way to introduce your new boyfriend to your family. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Even if he's the best of men, which Ira clearly wasn't, you've set your family up to think he's an asshole. In this case, Einhorn was an asshole, and no amount of positive or negative foreshadowing could change that fact. He was rude and disrespectful to Holly in front of her family. He was disrespectful to her parents. He put his feet up on their dinner table. He acted like a punk ass, which may not have been a phrase folks used in the 70s, but it's the phrase I use based on interviews with Holly's family. Her brother was quoted as calling their relationship that of master and pet. And that's eventually the role it seemed Einhorn expected Holly to play in their relationship. and Holly were the crazy breakup to make up, on again, off again, he's no good for me, but it doesn't matter because I love him sort of couple. In other words, they were both fucked from the beginning. Because if you're going to disrespect your lady in front of her family, how badly must you treat her in private? And it wasn't only Holly that reported abuse, physical and emotional abuse at the hands of Ira. The women he dated before Holly had very similar stories, but so many of these stories about Ira's abuse were kept private. They didn't come out until a few years later, when it was too late. After almost five years of dating, Holly Maddox finally found the courage to leave Ira Einhorn for good. No going back, no second, third, fourth chances. Now, this was the summer of 1977. Holly and Ira were vacationing in Europe with friends, and Holly just couldn't take it anymore. So she left. She left him in Europe. She flew back to the States. She told her friends and family that she'd finally had enough. She was done. Holly Maddox didn't even return to Philadelphia. She needed a complete and utter change. She went to stay with friends in New York, and while she was there, she met a kind man who quickly captured her heart. She called Einhorn and told him it was over, and for a little while, Holly was happy. Now, Einhorn, you can probably guess, is the kind of guy that wouldn't take no for an answer. He hounded and harassed Holly. He threatened to destroy or trash any of the belongings she may have left in their apartment. And here's a lesson, folks. Sometimes your shit just isn't worth it. You can buy new shit. Sometimes there are situations from which it is infinitely more valuable to walk away, even if that means there are belongings left behind. It's just stuff. Stuff can be replaced. 
Holly wanted her belongings, but she didn't want to go back to Philly and see Ira. She called four different people, friends of hers, mutual friends of hers and Ira's, trying to find someone that could go to the apartment on her behalf and collect her belongings or someone that would go with her. But nobody did. Holly Maddox returned to Philly on September 9th by herself. She planned to grab her things from Ira's apartment and then come straight back to New York City. And she was never seen again. Holly's family knew she was going to see Ira in September 1977, and weeks went by with no phone call from Holly. And then it was the holidays, and her family was celebrating without her, which meant it really wasn't a celebration at all, because unless the people you love the most are there with you, the holidays don't seem to matter. And people asked Ira about Holly, and he said, sure, she came here to grab a few of her things. I got in the shower, and by the time I got out, she was gone. She said she was leaving. And that was bullshit. She may have been a modern young woman trying to make a new life for herself. She'd just recently turned 30, but Holly was still close with her family. There's no way, according to all of her family members, that she would go weeks, let alone months, without letting them know where she was, or at least letting them know she was okay. She would not have abandoned this new man in her life back in New York without a word. Her family called the Philadelphia police and they questioned Einhorn shortly after Holly Maddox's disappearance. But he said he didn't know anything. He said she moved to New York and broke up with him. And that was the extent of his knowledge about Holly. And that was the extent of the investigation by Philadelphia PD. So Holly's family hired a private detective and he did more than anyone to help find Holly Maddox. He was incessant in his quest to uncover what happened to Holly and his prime suspect was Ira Einhorn. Maybe Ira's friends and the Philadelphia community couldn't see him as a callous, violent man, but Holly's family could because they knew Holly suffered emotional and physical abuse when she was with Einhorn. After a year and a half, the private detective had finally collected enough evidence to go to Philadelphia police, and there was so much evidence that they were able to obtain a search warrant for Ira Einhorn's apartment. And his apartment was disgusting. There was shit everywhere. From the outside, it was a big, beautiful duplex that had been split into multiple units. Inside, Einhorn's apartment looked like something out of hoarders, although maybe it was the early stages of hoarding, so no jars of piss yet, but it was pretty bad. The detective on the scene was a man named Michael Chitwood, and Detective Chitwood served the search warrant, and what he found inside was horrific. Now in the closet, and the only thing that is left in the closet after all the boxes and the suitcase has been removed is the steamer trunk. And now the odor that I had smelled initially is even more profound. And I went to open the trunk and there was a lock on the trunk. So I turned to Einhorn once again and I said, do you have a key for this lock? And he said, no, he didn't have a key. I then got a crowbar and I was able to remove the mechanism. And when I opened the trunk, I noticed laying right on the top where newspapers and then I noticed that the trunk was all layered with styrofoam. I then proceeded to start moving everything to the left and the first thing I noticed was a hand and the hand was mummified. The hand was looked as though somebody or Holly had tried to push the trunk open. Holly's autopsy revealed she suffered severe blunt force trauma to her head. She was bludgeoned repeatedly, but not exactly to death. The medical examiner determined Holly Maddox was likely still alive when she was stuffed in the steamer trunk. Barely alive, but alive. Her hands appeared as if she tried to claw her way out but she couldn't. The trunk was in a packed and locked closet filled with boxes, and her own body in the trunk was covered with clothing and styrofoam. 
Ira Einhorn was charged with the murder of Holly Maddox over a year and a half after she went missing, and the entire time her body was in Einhorn's apartment. Einhorn became known as the Unicorn Killer. His last name translates into one horn, and that then became Unicorn. He was even called Unicorn before Holly's murder, again, one of the more self-aggrandized titles he placed upon his own head. Yet even with a murder charge, Einhorn still held center stage in Philadelphia. On April 3, 1979, he was presented at Philadelphia's City Hall in courtroom 625, and there he was represented by an attorney named Arlen Specter. And if that name is familiar to you, it's because he eventually became Pennsylvania Senator Arlen Specter. Einhorn had a litany of prominent men stream through the courtroom singing his praises as character witnesses and told the judge there was simply no way he was capable of killing Holly Maddox, even though her mummified remains were found in his steamer trunk, locked in a closet in his home. Her suitcase full of belongings was still in that same closet. The city of Philadelphia had seen the trunk carried out of his home, the trunk that had been her death chamber. Besides the trunk, there was witness testimony from Einhorn's neighbor who claimed she heard screams coming from Einhorn's apartment on September 9th, the day Holly returned to Philadelphia to get her belongings from Ira. Maybe you could have called the fucking police? And then there was the dark, syrupy brown fluid that actually turned out to be bodily fluid leaking from the trunk through the floor of the closet in Ira's second floor apartment into the kitchen in the apartment below. On top of that, there was Holly Maddox's diary, page after page of her experiences with Ira Einhorn and his cruelty. Hitting people is never a sign of love. Unfair. It's a trip mindfuck. I wake at 5.30, get up to go. I don't like that he follows me and won't let me go. Yanks me back. I scream, silently enraged at him. I don't like that he has the power. Struggle. He carries me into the bedroom, wrestles me to the floor. It is violent. We are both very fucked up. I lie paralyzed in fear. And none of that mattered because Einhorn was granted bail. And his bail was cheap. $40,000, which even for 1979 was pretty low for a murder charge. Once Einhorn was out on bail, Arlen Specter handed his case over to another attorney, and Einhorn began this one-man crusade all over the city of Philadelphia, telling anyone who would listen stories about the CIA and the FBI setting him up. It was a conspiracy. He didn't kill Holly. Didn't even know she was in his house this whole time. That was the government trying to get him out of the city. They planted her body in his house. The CIA was taking him down because he was such a prominent activist. Remember his friends calling him an egomaniac? Well, why don't we add crazy fucking liar to that description while we're at it? By 1981, Ira Einhorn's trial was on the horizon. And that's when he decided to skip town. And he didn't just skip town, but he skipped the country. His first stop was Ireland, and it would be one of many stops around Europe in Einhorn's efforts to evade justice. The crazy thing was... The family in Ireland from whom he rented a room had a trip to the States just a few months after Einhorn moved in. While they were visiting Chicago, they found out about his murder charge in Philadelphia. So when they returned to Ireland, the Weir family told Einhorn, you've got 20 minutes to get out of our house. You know why we're asking you to leave. Don't ask us any questions. And he didn't. He packed and he rolled. And even though the Weir family alerted the police, there was no extradition treaty between Ireland and the United States. For five years, Philadelphia district attorneys and detectives were always a few steps behind Ira Einhorn. In 1986, Ira Einhorn was back in Ireland after traveling around other parts of Europe, and he changed his name to Ben Moore. He was back in Ireland visiting friends at Trinity College because he was ever the scholar. And whom should he run into? And I mean literally, physically run into, because these two men banged into each other because they tried exiting the same doorway. But Mr. Weir, the man from whom he rented a room back in 1981, 
Einhorn started a fight with Weir, telling him you're trying to ruin my life, and Mr. Weir called the police, but at the time, Ireland had no extradition treaty with the U.S., so there was no way to get Einhorn back to the country, and he rolled again. What are the odds? The man who called the cops on him in 1986, the man who crashed into him on a college campus, is the same man who rented him a room in a different part of Ireland five years earlier. That is some weird-ass coincidence or serendipity. Well, serendipity is too positive a word. Maybe if he could have been captured and extradited in 86, we could call it serendipity. So Ira Einhorn was in the proverbial wind again, but... District Attorney Lynn Abraham, along with the ADA and countless members of law enforcement, are still trying to bring a case against Einhorn. And as much as I hate the wrong that I believe Lynn Abraham caused Lois Fakarsen, in the case of Ira Einhorn, I think she nailed it. In 1993, the city of Philadelphia tried Ira Einhorn in absentia. There was more than enough evidence between witness testimony, Heidi Maddox's suitcase in the closet, the same closet where her body was found inside a steamer trunk, that same closet that leaked bodily fluid down onto the first floor apartment, and there were two hippie girls that came forward from 1979 whom Einhorn asked to help him move a steamer trunk filled with documents about the Russians that he'd stolen from the CIA. Seriously, dude? What the actual fuck? He was found guilty in absentia and sentenced to life in prison which would have been great had he actually been in the country to serve the time. About a year after Einhorn's absentia trial in Philadelphia, the ADA got a tip that he was living in Sweden, married to a woman for 10 years named Annika Floden. The ADA got that juicy nugget from the very woman who'd been paying for Einhorn to evade the authorities, a woman named Barbara Brofman. Brofman was the same person who paid Einhorn's bail in 1979. She married into the Seagram's fortune and clearly had enough money to just throw around so a murderer could take his own Euro trip. This woman must have decided she'd either bet on the wrong horse and Einhorn was guilty as shit, or she just got tired of funding his jet setting around the European countryside and tried to turn him in. But just like when Ira Einhorn was in Ireland, by the time the police arrived in Stockholm, both he and his wife were gone. A few years later, in 1997, police learned Anakin Floden had applied for a French driver's license. They tracked Einhorn using the address on his wife's license application, and sure enough, they found Ira Einhorn living in Champagne-Mouton, about four hours southwest of Paris near Cognac. Annika married Einhorn before his trial in absentia, And I don't know when she became aware he was charged with the murder of Holly Maddox. Is that something you tell your intended? Hey, baby, sometimes I wear black socks with sandals and I was charged with killing my ex-girlfriend. In any case, it sounds like no matter when he told her, Annika was a staunch believer in his innocence. My first reaction came when I learned that Jadua was back already. It went too quick. That upset me a great deal because I felt, you know, this is going, not going to go well. The jury has not taken the time needed to uh, really look into things. And then that whatever half an hour it was before the actual verdict was a very, very difficult moment. And I felt just so profound sadness when that verdict came down. Some of the evidence that was presented is devastating. It really is. And of course, I feel the impact of that. But still, the actual proof and all these indications that there are doubts, they remain with me. He is consistently being very, very strong on that he is innocent. It's very difficult for me who have not experienced such behavior from him to imagine it. I know that there has been in his past and he has acknowledged that and he says that he has worked that through. So finally, in 1997, almost 20 years after Holly's murder, this crazy motherfucker is arrested and is going to be shipped back to the United States to serve his life sentence. Yeah, not exactly. 
Einhorn faced an extradition trial in France in November of 1997. The problem was the French didn't like the concept of a trial in absentia. And to be fair, it wasn't just the French. It really was the European Court of Human Rights. They didn't think this should be an end-all, be-all decision of someone's guilt because in France and other parts of Europe at the time, if a person was tried in absentia, then apprehended after their conviction, they were guaranteed a new trial. And that wasn't the law in Pennsylvania. It certainly wasn't the law in the United States. So France decided not to extradite. Thank you, France. Merde. Bessieu de mer, fille de pute. Yes, I can curse just as prolifically in French as I can in English. You learn a little something new about me almost every episode. So here's where the case gets even more complicated. That decision didn't just fuck with this case, but it fucked with the family of Holly Maddox. When Holly's family found out Einhorn had been apprehended in France in 1997, they thought that was it. He was finally captured. He'll be sent back to the U.S. He will go straight to jail and start his life sentence. Do not pass go. Do not collect your measly $200. But that is not at all what happened, and it would take almost five more years before Einhorn would get extradited. So France refused to extradite Ira Einhorn because the European Convention of Human Rights preserves the deportation of anyone within its borders to a country where they are not guaranteed a fair trial. So Philadelphia DA Lynn Abraham went to the Pennsylvania legislature and they passed a law in Pennsylvania that would grant Einhorn a new trial upon his return to the U.S. And they did this in the hopes that France would agree to extradite him. So an actual law was passed in our state so that we could get this scumbag out of France and back to the U.S. This step was absolutely necessary to get France to hold another extradition hearing. But before that could happen, Ira Einhorn's defense attorney in the U.S., a really smart dude named Ted Simon, who just happened to be an international law expert, claimed the Einhorn law enacted by Pennsylvania was unconstitutional. So according to trial information from Einhorn's 1998 extradition trial in France, Ted Simon raised two points of appeal. The first one was, as a result of established American constitutional principles of the doctrine of separation of powers, this new retrial law goes against all notions of good governance and the rule of law for a legislature to interfere with a final judgment of the judiciary. Okay, that's a whole lot of legal jargon. Basically, what it's saying is you can't change a court's judgment or ask a court to retry someone after an initial trial has been finalized. So while it would seem like a defense attorney would want Einhorn to get a new trial, if he doesn't get a new trial, he gets to stay in France, which is really what Einhorn wanted. The other point that Simon raised was that this law, which some people call the Einhorn law, seemed as if it was enacted just to apply in Einhorn's case. It didn't seem like there was going to be any application of this law outside of Einhorn's case, which shouldn't be the case either. If you're going to pass a law in the state, a law that applies to a particular set of circumstances, it can't apply to those circumstances for simply one person. It has to apply to all persons who fall into that set of circumstances. And the champion of fairness in me, oh, I hate this, but Simon had a point. You cannot change constitutional law because we let a murderer slip through our fingers. You can't enact a new law because you're trying to catch one man, no matter how badly he should be brought to justice, because that creates a risk of what that law could do to anyone else under whom the law could possibly apply. Holy fuck, this case was crazy. I was talking to a dear friend online last night, and we were talking about what a nightmare this case was for everyone involved, but none more than Holly Maddox and her family. So while all these legal and judicial ramblings played out, Einhorn was ensconced in France in a little mill house in the country with his pretty Swedish wife, who, by the way, looked like an older version of Holly Maddox, and that's creepy as fuck. The French court, and I'm quoting here, declared itself incompetent to make a decision. So the issue of Einhorn's extradition was elevated to the French prime minister. On July 21st in 2000, he agreed to extradite Ira Einhorn. But six months later, in December, Einhorn was still chilling in France, probably sipping a full-bodied Bordeaux, eating brie and baguettes. Einhorn took his case to the French Court of Appeals to fight extradition, and it took six months for the Court of Appeals to rule, and they upheld the extradition. So then Einhorn went to an even higher court, the European Court of Human Rights. 
Finally, a year after the prime minister agreed to extradite him, the European Court of Human Rights on July 18th in 2001 ruled Einhorn could be extradited back to the U.S. So a mob of French police, the gendarmes, show up at Einhorn's house with the press. What does he do? He grabs a dull, rusty knife and tries to cut his own throat in front of the gendarmes and the press. A dull knife. Really? Why don't you use a dull, rusty spoon? It would have done the same thing. He's a faker. He had no intention of killing himself. He's an egomaniacal narcissist. Well, he did have blood um, all over his neck, so maybe it wasn't as dull as everyone reported. But instead of going with the police, Einhorn wanted to talk to the press first. I have something to say very directly to Mr. Jospin. Il crée ça. He is responsible. He is the prime minister. He's responsible for all the people. Finally, three days later, Ira Einhorn was shipped back to America with his neck covered in bandages. Ira Einhorn was again tried for the murder of Holly Maddox in 2002. And on October 17th, he was again found guilty. And he was again sentenced to life in prison. It was 23 years after the murder of Holly Maddox. Ira Einhorn was 62 years old. Last year, Ira Einhorn was moved from medium security SCI Hootsdale to a minimum security prison that provides care for seriously ill inmates. Now, no one has officially stated that Ira Einhorn is seriously ill. That would be breaking rules of confidentiality. But he is now 76 years old. He's been in prison for 14 years here in Pennsylvania. And I think that's certainly a possible factor of his relocation. And the Maddox family? Holly's father committed suicide in 1988. And her mother died just two years later from emphysema. Her brother and sister sued Ira Einhorn in 1999, so he couldn't make any money off his story or profit from her death in any way. And they went through hell the hell of Holly's disappearance in 1979, the devastating news of her death, realizing she'd been in Philadelphia the entire time she'd been missing, locked away in a steamer trunk in Ira Einhorn's closet. And I have to say, I personally feel if the Philadelphia police had pushed Einhorn even just a little bit more when Holly Maddox first disappeared. He was the last person to see her alive. She called four different friends in Philly on September 9th before leaving New York to go to the apartment she shared with Einhorn because she did not want to go back there alone. She tried to get someone to go for her or maybe even go with her, and no one could or no one would. All of those people who knew Holly because of Ira Einhorn, not one of them went with her to get her belongings. Not one of them went to the police when she disappeared. Not one of them stepped up, and the police didn't do much at all when Holly disappeared. And yeah, it might not have changed the end of this story. Ira Einhorn may have still murdered Holly Maddox, but maybe her family wouldn't have suffered so much. I hate that Ira Einhorn is called the unicorn killer because for me, growing up as a kid in the 80s, unicorns will always be Mia Farrow from The Last Unicorn. People say Ira Einhorn is like a unicorn because he was so unique and one of a kind. No, he wasn't. I think he was a poser. Someone who was able to position himself in so many different circles that you didn't know who the real Ira Einhorn was. He was an evil chameleon who could adjust to any situation he was in and convince you he was the guy, whatever that guy needed to be. And he was really a piece of shit who capitalized on a movement for his own self-serving ego. Holly Maddox knew who he really was, and she paid for that knowledge with her life. People also compare Ira Einhorn to a unicorn because legend has it, as peaceful as these creatures are, when they are backed into a corner, they will fight. That's not Ira Einhorn either. He wasn't backed into a corner. Holly Maddox didn't back him into a corner. He was two or three times her size, and he fought anyway. And then he ran like a scared little bitch. Maybe he should be called Thumper instead, but that would be seriously insulting Thumper, and I like Disney. Earth Day is just a few weeks away. This asshole was not the face of Earth Day. 
He was the face of a guy that grabbed a microphone for 20 minutes so he could look like he was the face of Earth Day. And you don't need to be out front to make a difference. There are so many ways you can support Earth Day and take care of this planet, even if you just go to your local grocery store, buy a flower, and plant them around your yard with your kid. But if you want to do something a little more social, I will have links to a lot of different Philly Earth Day events on my Facebook and Twitter pages, and you can search for Earth Day events in your own community online. I have a few special thanks to share before we go. The first is thank you to Lainey, the host of the True Crime Fan Club, for providing the voiceover acting for Holly Maddox Diary entries. And thank you, as always, to Emmy Sarah for the music you heard in this week's episode. You can find out more about Emmy on her website at emmysarah.com and download her music on iTunes. That's it from me. Ciao for now, twisters.